Okay, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll show you the clippings first. You know, the, the brief clipping. I'm going to refer to many different forms of, uh, of uh, performances theatre. So I'll take about 15 minutes to cover this first. Then we can go into the discussion, the web paper and the discussion. Otherwise I have to stop and keep you know, showing them in between. Okay, so what we will do is we will start off with the... Uh, the I don't know, you start with the shadow play. Okay, I'll start with the wine cool it uh, first. And then, uh, I don't know. I don't Essentially, it's still the same as the Thai form. I'll discuss that later. Okay, so look at this. Other wine coolant forms we have here. We've got uh, uh, wine coolant. Uh, uh, this one. Oh, no. Okay. 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 Napoknya kita kena pisau lah juga kok tu momo kapo Aku hello lah juga mic tu dia ini Aku nak pergi dia tanya orang okay, tiga orang ini Aku rasa tahu lah juga orang itu Hey orang okay, ini ni Dah boleh dia uh, cik adik dik Saya buat nak selalu dengan orang ini Bisa kerja yo. Yang ada dah dengan sama Orang okay, tiga orang ini Haa Dia mana lah juga dengar Oh ya pandai aku boleh pergi Mama rasa nak main teri lah juga hari ni Sama dia sangkit ya Mama sendiri Okay, this is an animation of uh, a Kelantang Wayne Kulit which is the East Coast mm. The East Coast uh, an animation of that and they have taken the three clowns from Thailand actually from Thai version it's called Wayne Kulit Wak Ya It just emphasizes comedy, there's no story or whatever so here we have a whole series of these animated uh, things uh, shown on, uh, on, on TV and so on, video recordings and so on. So the second uh, one, uh, let's go back. We got the... Uh, okay, then we do the start. <coughs> Star Wars is a very great movie, is it? They have uh, not seen million, maybe thousands of uh, Star Wars fans all over the countries. So when we want to perform the story of Star Wars, we have to be careful. So I mean, the character, some of it well designed, the music. Of course, we have to create uh, a specific music for the main character, Atapada, is it? Every puppeteer is trying to do a lot of voices, but when it comes to double the voice, we cannot do that. So based on our technology, 
with a few, uh, with the help of computer, so we able to do. Fusion shall replace the whole. This, uh, this puppeteer is a traditional puppeteer who also does the traditional Waikulit in, in Klantan, which is called Klantan Waikulit Siam. But then this is something they developed uh, five years ago. This was Star Wars, and this became very popular with all the young, young you know, generation and so on. And also, I'll, I'll mention that later. Okay, so this is a uh, wine cool it. Then we go to uh, my. So it's slightly modernized. Now this is a traditional one. Size. They want to be like Hollywood and, uh, and uh, you know, and so on. So they, they do this. The National Theatre. The first one was at the university. The second one was the original one. And then this is the third. See the transformation has changed. You know? Bangsawan, you have it here and you have it in Indonesia. 
energy as well. A slightly modernized change rather from the traditional. Of course, um, to, to look at the transformations that have taken place in the traditional genres. Now, briefly, uh, this is not intended for publication yet. I just wrote it, I thought it might, might be useful. So it will be available if you want it later, but uh, it will work, I have to work on it to further publish. Okay, so when you look at the traditional theatre of Southeast Asia, uh, and especially in the case of Malaysia, uh, we have various forms of uh, uh, theater, and most of them are in the, either in the process of decline or change of some kind. Now what I've done here is that I've taken the three main forms. Okay, there are others. Okay, what I've defined the traditional theater of Southeast Asia in terms of the, uh, the proto-theater, the earliest proto-theater uh, forms, basically st uh, storytelling and ritualistic forms, healing rituals and so on and so forth. We have a few examples of those and we have many which are similar to what you find in the Philippines or Sabah or elsewhere in Southeast Asia, Babylon and so on and so forth, those Bomo forms, those have not changed very much. Okay, these are more or less consistent uh, to, as, to, as to what they were before. And um, then we have the second group which I, I mentioned and that is the puppet theatre. So in Malaysia we only have the shadow play. And uh, we have got, uh, you saw two, two examples and uh, one of the animation types. So if you look at the shadow play, we have got uh, actually uh, four, used to have four kinds of shadow play in Malaysia. All in, well, not in East Malaysia, but in uh, the peninsula, all of them. In the South, Johor, of course, we have uh, Waikuli Purwa, which is uh, from Java, and it's still done there. It used to be very popular, but now we have just a few, couple of puppeteers left. But they, they perform in the same way as it's done in Java, more or less. So that, I think, uh, does not need much of our attention. And then the others are the theatre forms which are found in the East Coast again and the North. I've shown you a couple of examples. The first one, of course, Nang Talung uh, version came from southern Thailand. And then that spread to south to Malaysia, or the, at least west, uh, northern part of uh, peninsula Malaysia. And in the process, it underwent change, which I'll come to in a moment. So that's the second category. Now, so these are the developed theatre forms. First, we have the shadow play. The early proto theatre forms are the healing ritual, storytelling, and so on, that I which I won't go into because we, we have a few examples, but those are not really the subject of our discussion today. We're discussing about change, innovation, and so on. And so I thought I'd just leave those out. But when we come to the developed forms, then we have the shadow play, and then we have the, the Mak Yong dance theatre, which is very important, we'll come to that uh, later. And we have the Bangsawan, the third type I showed you, which is what is called loosely opera, Malay opera, Southeast opera, and so on and so forth. Because the term is a misnomer, it's a problem, uh, but that's why they call it so. So this one is, a, in a way, this is a kind of a transitional theatre form. Because uh, the way it developed and evolved from India in the 1880s, and then it came to Southeast Asia and uh, led on into variations up to Indonesia as well, and Borneo, I mean not Borneo, and even up to Thailand and so on. And she, she went all over Southeast Asia. So I'm picking this in, 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 that, in that order. So the first uh, important form, of course, is to, first thing is to look at what led to the changes that have come over. I'll summarize them quickly. So in the first place, when you look at change, of course, in performing arts, as we have uh, discussed this earlier today as well, uh, change is inevitable. Okay. Transformation, change is inevitable. Okay, so now what are the factors? Okay, the factors are social, political, religious, and economic, and so on. These are the main factors you have identified in other writings, in other places as well, as well, uh, uh, develop on some of these ideas. Basically, you know, uh, uh, four or five main reasons why data is on the decline, or why it transforms or changes with the passage of time. And so I'll summarize that, uh, come back to those. So now, uh, so when you look at our, our, our discussion today, innovation, development of new styles, before, we are, uh, before examples are presented, it may be necessary to state that although innovation may be welcome under certain circumstances and easily achieved, 
uh, when induced, uh, especially when induced rather than natural, in, it is not always the best thing. I mean, from my own perspective, I feel that that is not always the best thing to do. Change is easy to do, but you know, uh, and, and uh, factors and pleasures are great for change. But there are some other important elements which uh, have to be uh, kept in mind. And this has to do with the idea of continuity and so on. The important principles in which is often neglected in terms of the in the in terms of what the particular genre is compared to the what it is today. Right? We have seen that the change over the years. So um, we have some form of changes and changes in what we have today and uh, this is some of the problems that we are looking at. So when it comes to change and innovation, traditional theatre in the situation in Malaysia is rather more complicated than in most other South Asian societies. And I'll give you the reasons why. And uh, oh, it has become more complicated recently under two pressure of two uh, main processes, which are parallel processes. Okay, one is Islamization, two is modernization. Okay, because modernization has been going on, it began a long time back. Islamization is something which is quite new. It's also there, it's always been there, the issue of whether uh, a form of theatre or any other kind of performance, whether it is uh, acceptable from the Islamic perspective. I mean, Malaysia faces the same problem in some, some places. And uh, yet, yeah, now in Malaysia, this problem has become very acute in, in recent decades, the last two decades or so, it's become very, very acute. Okay, because of the um, interpretations of what is uh, allowed and what is not allowed in Islam, and what is halal, what is haram, and all that. For every other day, we find new things being declared haram if you're following the arguments in Malaysia these days. So this is a, a very serious problem in the last 20 years, I would say. So why include it? As an old history, the oldest history, of course, in this uh, among the shadow play forms is uh, that of uh, Wainkulit or the shadow play. Now, uh, we have many, many theories about where Wainkulit came from, how it developed, and so on. And the theories either deal in general with, with the shadow play all over Asia, Southeast Asia, and so on and so forth. So then we have the idea that it came from India, it came from China, it came, came from Middle East, it came from Kazakhstan, all kinds of theories have been given by people like Brandon and so on and so forth um, before I discuss these things. So I, have, I feel that now it's, uh, well, it's difficult for us to establish a single origin for the shadow play. So I've given up discussing those issues anymore. It started in the 19th century by Jacques Brunet first mentioned India as home of the puppet theatre. And then since then there all this argument and I feel that we can't go on anymore. We can't find new, new elements there. So let's forget about that. So I look within Southeast Asia. So I'm not connecting it to India or to China or to any other part of the world because it cannot be done. There's no way. Right? So within Southeast Asia, then I've got my own ideas and my own theories about what uh, could, be, could have happened. And my, I, I, I demonstrate that in a paper I presented in Bali about three years ago. I created a new formula and said, look, Java is the center of Southeast Asia. So in a way, we have to look at Java as the beginning of everything, okay? As one of the mandala areas I've, I've got, as well as, as a main area of focus, I call it the mandala theory. Java, and from Java, it spread to Bali and Sumatra and Kalimantan and so on and so forth, up to southern Thailand. And this is where the shadow play has spread, you know, this region originating from Java. And this happened at the end of the Majapahi period, when uh, the Hindu regime was overthrown and overthrown and Islam came in, into Java. So the first thing they tried to do was ban all these uh, traditional performances, Wali, Wali Smila and Wali Zongo, right? And so then later they began to accommodate and so on with, with some changes brought in and so on. So at that point then the, 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 the theatre then moved out of Java into Bali and other islands and I believe that that was when it came to Tantan and even to southern Thailand. So this would go back to about 15th century with Mojokarto, uh, the collapse of Mojokarto and so on and so forth. Right? That was the uh, period. So from there then we have the, the, so that is one of the areas that I look at and I see from Java, we have got influences in, in almost all the countries of Southeast Asia up to Southern Thailand and so on. The second center is the Philippines which is uh, unconnected to the rest of Southeast Asia. Okay? Because there we get a Western kind of influences. What we have the, the Southern, Southern Filipino uh, areas, of course I've got the so-called Malay or Southeast Asian elements, but uh, there are no major theater forms there. Not worth mentioning, I've been there, I've stayed there a year in the Philippines doing my research and so on. So there are no significant forms of Southern Filipino theatre. Of course, whatever there are, are developed, you know, from based on legends and so on and so forth, uh, are quite recent. So then Philippines stand by itself as the only country in this region which has got a Western kind of uh, uh, base. Then I take the second, uh, the next uh, mandala is Cambodia, where again Indian influence, 
and coming in from the north, okay, through Myanmar and so on and so forth, and, and Cambodia this is a very strong uh, Hindu Buddhist uh, center, and so that's the, the, the third, and then we have the north, which is Vietnam, and so that's Chinese, Chinese influence. So I drew the whole diagram in this way, and I think it makes some sense if you look at it this way. So based on that, then I would say that when you call it Kelantan, of course, uh, it's very important. It came from Indonesia, in my opinion, and then, of course, the elements that they need are all Hindu and so on, because the story is based on the Ramayana. Okay, the main story, of course, is all these traditions is the Ramayana, and, of course, in Indonesia, the Mahabharata as well. But once you move out of Java and Bali and so on, then you come into Malaysia and Thailand and so on and so forth, Mahabharata is not important anymore. And there are reasons for all of this. If I just came back from a paper I gave in India, which is quite interesting, trying to look at all the influences that came from, from India all the way to, to Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, up to Malaysia, Northern Malaysia. I didn't go to Java, that's too complicated. I tried to look at that. I said, we have all these episodes coming in. Now, where did they come from? We all assume it's Valmiki, but it's not Valmiki. Right? So I pointed out this in a seminar about a month ago, exactly in, in, in Bangalore. A few new ideas came up, a few new names came up or possible sources. Okay, Kriti Vasa Ramayana is one I mentioned, and they were looking at me and saying, How do you know of this? I said, Well, I found it somewhere. Okay. So the variations have come into all that, but basically, okay, we have Ramayana as the main story, so the, in the Kantan as well as in Keda as well, in the two different forms of Shadow Play that we saw in the video just now. They both are originally based on the Ramayana. And then, of course, now what happened is that in each case, in the case of Tantan as well as in the case of the Kedar version, um, innovation began to take place quite some time back. Now, the first thing that happened was they created so called branch stories. Okay, Chita Ranting. The main story is a trunk story, Chita Poko. And then, as you can you have the tree story, the main story of the Ramayana, then you go off and off and off. So, you have the trunk, and then you have the, 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 the branch, and then you have the twig, and then you have the leaf, and you have the flower. So the story then goes all the way from the trunk to the flower. And by the time it goes halfway, you don't have Ramayana characters anymore. They bring in new characters, new episodes, borrowing from Panji stories and borrowing from other, so other sources as well. All right? So that's what the innovation that actually began a long time back. But they began to highlight comedy okay, instead of the main story. So new characters were created, new episodes were created for the older characters. Ramana died, but Sri Rama was still alive after the story ended. And so there are many episodes in which Sri Rama, at each adventure, he finds a new wife. And there's battles with Sita Devi and so on and so forth, in the pattern of uh, Garush Chandra Kirana and uh, Radhenu Katapati, the Javanese uh, hero and uh, uh, country hero. So these are the elements he borrowed. So the first steps which was changed were the development of so-called Poko to Ranting or branch stories. And they go on and on and on. This is a huge number of them. I've collected, I think, 200 of the stories already in the, in the, over the years. Right? So that's the first thing that happened there. And of course, then the other elements that were problematic were the Hindu prayers, mantra. Okay? Because the Kelantan government said, look, okay, ban wine kuli, ban mayong. They banned it, they still banned okay? in those provinces in the East Coast. And the main argument was, okay, why are we doing Hindu stories? Secondly, why are we doing these Hindu invocations at the beginning of performances? Because they start off with animistic uh, you know, uh, rituals, bukatana, muka, you know, sasajan, all that offerings are given to spirits and so on and so forth. So this was the problem you know, which actually came in. So the state government, which is an Islamic party government, uh, decided to ban all these things because and I, I talked to the chief minister and he said, well, look, why are all these Muslims doing prayers to Hindu gods? And all these animistic beings, and who are these? Jin and two, Jin and Antu figures. <laughs> so they stopped that. And then, so then, you know, in Kule itself began to decline. Partly because of that, but other factors too came in. Okay? Other factors were like, you know, okay, Dalangs never had the opportunity to perform very much. Okay? They depended on, you know, maybe nowadays, of course, even if they do a, a show a year, that's already a lot. So no performances means no income. Unless they have, you know, their own land and they do farming or they do other odd jobs. So musicians have gone into you know bechak, right, bechak riding, you know, and doing their part-time jobs, construction workers. At one time, we had a massive number of construct construction workers from Kelantan in Singapore. And we have the Kebara coming here, we have all that coming here from Kelantan. But in Kelantan is dying out. Okay, so shadow play was one of those that were badly affected. 
Okay, so we encourage, I mean, my own effort for uh, trying to develop this, I put to Dalang, and say, look, if Indonesia can have 30 kinds of wine kulit, why, why not Malaysia? Think of new ideas, new stories, and so on, you know? So I, I tried to talk to them, and when I was in the University of Science Malaysia, I actually got work with Dalang Hamza, the leading property at that time. He's passed away in the year 2001. So we developed, uh, you know, wine kulit based on Amir Hamza's story, an Islamic uh, history legend. We did Bunga uh, Bakawali, uh, Indian story, Indian Muslim, Raja Raja uh, Ika Raja Muda, and we did Sankanchil. Four stories based on four different traditions. In the university, I made the students cut the puppets based on the Dalang's uh, designs and so on and so forth, and they performed these things. But after that, when I left the university, that stopped the project, no more, you know, died up. Following that, I did two other efforts, you know, and I went to the say, look for new things, why are you doing all this traditional stuff, you know, so then I talked to the puppeteers in Kanta, I said, look, don't you, well, you, you can always create new stories with the Wayam. Then you don't have to worry about Buka Pangong, all those prayers and rituals and so on and so forth. Again, I know several efforts were made, but they did not succeed. Because they would make an effort, they have a performance or two, then they'll stop. Okay? So audiences were not developed and so on and so forth. Even the, the chief minister at one time said, okay, do an Islamic wine cooling. So they did that. They created a uh, women wearing you no know, tudong scarves and everything, you know. And then, but that also just one or two performances and it stopped. You know, they couldn't find sponsors and so on and so forth. And we don't even know where the puppets went. A whole set of puppets was designed for that. Nearly a hundred pieces were made, but we don't know where they are now. Right? So these are some of the efforts that went. And of course, I, mean, I think of all these experimental Wayang Pulit uh, uh, innovations, the most successful was Star Wars. Okay, you saw that one, a little bit of that just now. Okay? No, partly because you know, it picked up among the younger generation. And then it was done, of course, traditional music, traditional Dalang uh, involved in it. Okay, the puppets were designed based on traditional design, but of course, with innovations and so on. Right. Which is why I said earlier, it's easy to create new forms, but if you keep it within the tradition, it's more, more meaningful, more interesting. So the designs actually were created based on Tantan Wai Kule puppets. But the puppeteer is one of the most active puppeteers right now, I'm talking in the, in the, the screen just now. So he does that, and then, of course, the, the sponsorship was from, from Chinese uh, uh, groups in, in Kuala Lumpur, and some modern associations and so on came in and supported. And they had good audiences. I mean, I've seen that twice, and there were a lot of people watching. So they're trying to expand that repertoire, and of course, it got on TV and so on and so forth. So in a way, that became the first Malaysian wine pulling, which was found, which was, uh, you see, you couldn't understand the other's language, was a dialect. It's either Kedah dialect or Kelantan dialect or something. None of you understood anything, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, the cartoon itself, uh, you know, it's the dialect. So no, it did not go outside certain provinces. It stayed there, local level. We teach this thing at the university, yeah, we have a wine kulit dalang coming in, and students learn how to perform just like Dao says, this is how they're doing Balinese dance. Well, we did that. But students, you know, once the course is finished, they forget about it, they go home, that's the end of the story. You know, they, don't, they don't continue. So then, that, in the sense then, to wine kulit, uh, uh, Star Wars became the, the most successful of the innovative wine kulit uh, forms. They're still trying to develop more stories and expand the repertoire and so on. Right, but as long as money is available, I think they can do it. So that's, that's a summary of the Wainkulit uh, picture in Lantan, Malaysia as a whole. Right? So of the four forms we had earlier, we had the Thai form, Nang Talung, which you saw, which became Wainkulit Gede. The, the first Dalang bought it from Thailand, learned it in Thailand, and came over to Malaysia. Then he's, he passed away, his son took did not know the, know, the, know the Ramayana. So he started using Malay movie stories, Hindustani stories from Indian, Indian movies. He was studying, studying music, it became very popular. All right? So that was the only group in Kedah which was supported by the state government. And he died about uh, six months ago or something, and that's that, that why could. So I don't know what the next step is. You know, his son is very young, and I don't know who else will do it, or if they, that tradition will die out itself. So that means, you know, now out of the four traditions, we have uh, Waikuli Klantang. 130 puppeteers in the 1969, now we have four puppets, four puppeteers left. Okay. Somebody, I mean, Sweeney counted 130. I argue with the figure, but it's close to 100 plus. Now we have four. And the four, because a couple of them are not very young anymore, so, you know, in a matter of time, they will stop somehow to perform that, you see, so. So the, that's, that's why I believe. So the factors are then, as I said just now, partly political, partly religious. You'll, you'll see that later. Okay. When you call it Gedek, the Nang Talung, I showed you the, the first screen we saw. 
Okay, this one I already discussed that this developed from Thailand into Canada, northern parts of northern states. Because you know the puppeteers used to cross the boundary. There was no boundary, there was no Malaysia, there was no Thailand, and then so on until you know 1909, 1910, the boundary was established. So Thai puppeteers used to come quite far south, you know, as far as Penang, even further further south. And they used to perform Thai puppet uh, shows in Malaysia, in Thai language. And they still come, the Buddhist temples have, have a festival, or when a priest you know, passes away in one of the temples, then they perform the Thai Nangkalong. So the Malaysian version developed, and now uh, I think it's going to go off, you know, it's going to die out. Okay, the second thing I showed was the Mak Yong Dance Theatre. This is a, an all entirely different kind of a story, also very interesting. Now this is regarded as one of the oldest theatre forms in the country. I did my PhD on this and I really you know, discovered a lot of interesting uh, details. It was started as a folk theatre. Although theory says it's, it's palace and it's tana and so on and so forth, all of which is nothing, you know, is not that not correct. Right? Uh, there's there's, a, there's a, the whole uh, sort of legend behind why they want to claim that everything is royal. Mang Saman is royal, Wankula is royal, Mahyung is royal, everything is from the Raja Raja and all that. When I ask them for the evidence, they cannot give, of course. Then they say, yeah, during Nakasuka time, I say, I don't know where Nakasuka was, tell me please. And who was the king there, and what was his name, and what was he doing, and they can't tell me, of course, you know. So there's no evidence of any kind of royal support for the traditional theatre. Except for a short period when the, uh, I think three Dalangs went to Indonesia to learn Wankulit, uh, Madhya, Wankulit, uh, Panji, okay, uh, the Dok. They learned Wankulit, the Dok. So they combined that, they brought that to Malaysia, and they performed that in Malaysia. I think one Dalang did not come back. Who did. Okay. And they were called Bomo, Dalang the Raja, Royal Dalang, and so on and so forth, Royal Puppeteers. And uh, well, one of them died when I was doing my research in the 70s. His collection is in the museum now. And then this, the last one died when I was also doing my research. And I bought his work, all, all his puppets. And they're now in University Science Museum in Penang. So that tradition is dead. <laughs> all right. So now, therefore, so the four traditions that I mentioned is not actually only one is a, is alive, and then of course we have the the, the, the the innovation in terms of comedy. Okay, you saw the cartoon, a, a, a slight section uh, of the cartoon. They're doing a lot of that now because there's no permit to perform. See, to perform you need a permit from the police departments and so on and so forth. Okay, so the lines cannot perform anymore. They discourage you from permits. Okay, and then so they started uh, you know, trying to record these things. Sell the CDs by the by in the, the Pasar Malam, Pasang, Pasang, Pasar Siang, wherever they can, you know. They record them, no, no, it's quite easy, so they do that and they sell CDs uh, in these uh, markets. You can buy those quite easily. So, a few puppeteers, the newer ones, have decided no more public performances, we'll just do recordings and sell. Right? So, I'll come back to documentation later. So, Mark Young, okay, as I said, is the oldest, one of the oldest forms. Again, the same problem here, see. Um, uh, in 2010, I think 2005 maybe, 2005 they wanted to nominate a theatre form for UNESCO World Heritage, you know, the intangible heritage. And they consulted me and I said, Mark Yong. And they failed twice and the third time they asked me to get in, so I did. But I make a better proposal and it got accepted by UNESCO. So it's recognised as World Heritage, intangible heritage. But beyond that, what happened, they, they, they don't want to do anything. Again, this is uh, found in Klantan on the East Coast. Sometimes they know it's, it's totally banned. Why? Because women play male roles. The, you, know, you saw that the ladies were playing the hero, the, the you know, crown and all. But actually, that was a hero, a deva, a god character. So not only women play male roles, which is haram in Islam, transvestism out. Why are you doing stories about deva? Who are these devas? Who are these gods? Right? So again, un Islamic. So it was, it was it's an ironic situation because on the one hand we nominated that for UNESCO and got the award. And now we're supposed to protect that heritage. And uh, they refused to do that. They say, sorry, that this is all wrong, we shouldn't have to do these things. On the state level, it's officially bad. The federal level, you ask them, they say, they won't give you a clear answer, yes or no. And they say they're teaching in the National Arts Academy, you saw those modern kinds of questions uh, that take place in, in the National Arts Academy. Which is, that's why it's a disaster because when the academy teaches this kind of modernized versions and so on and so forth. Because the argument is that you know, we don't want this village, backward village theatre forms to represent Malaysia. We want the really sophisticated Changi, Changi ones. So if they are not there, we create the Changi ones in the national. 
National Theatre, you know. So we have, you know, a set like Mayo. Mayo is performing in a, in a space like this. The theatre, you don't need a big theatre, a space like this. Audience sitting all around. Now they put it on the huge stage of the National Theatre in KL, you know, with all the fantastic lighting and then all the backdrops, you know, ships coming down and all kinds of things going up and down, all the flats. So that's what they feel is, is what they should be doing. We must show the people in Malaysia only. And this is what we can do. We can show, we can love on Hollywood, we can love on uh, any other part of the world, you know, we are the top in the world and so on and so forth. So there's a contradiction that you know, I've been fighting battles with them. You read all my blogs, you read all my writing, I keep attacking the ministry. I tell I refuse to talk to them anymore and they refuse to get me involved in anything. I refuse to teach in the institutions. I say, sorry, if you want me to corrupt everything and make you touristy, I'm not interested. Right? So this is the thing now. So where we do we go when we talk about innovation? We nominate this item for UNESCO and then we try to destroy it. And they say, well, you got the name, Namas or Rapa, Chukobra. Okay, that's enough. Okay, what else do you want? So in the discussion of all this, then we have got a problem of uh, uh, sponsorship. Government support has never been strong, okay? despite the claim that all oh, Sultans were interested in this, then none. There's no evidence. And that whole theory is which was invented by an Irishman. The whole theory of, you know, royal patronage and all this thing, this thing was invented by an Irishman. But he married a princess in London, and he was trying to show the Malay that they are the most civilized race in the world. And I told them, I don't know what a Malay is even now. No? So we are talking about this thing, if you don't even know what a Malay is, how do you find the Malay art forms? And all the three mentioned are not from Malaysia, they are from Thailand, from Indonesia, from India, and so on and so forth. So in that context, then, we have a problem uh, when we deal with tradition in terms of policies and so on and so forth. Now, Bangsawan, we have already shown, shown uh, a snippet from that. That came in the 1880s, especially from India. So India, based on the Western traditions of theatre which were active in India in the mid-19th centuries, the British started the theatres in India, modern theatres, they, they built up the theatres. And they didn't allow any Indian to get in there except backstage work and, you know, other things. And so it so happened that the Parsi merchants were there, very powerful, very rich. They brought up a couple of British theatres. And the British couldn't manage and all that. So they started bringing in Indian folk theatre and so on and so forth. And then revised it, modified it, made it suitable for proscenium, staging, brought in legends and stories from Middle East, from the Arab stories, Persian stories, Indian stories. Shakespeare was performed in, in that version. And somehow this kind of theatre form, with proscenium, staging and all that, came into Southeast Asia through Penang, you know, and then got you know, changed and adopted and became Bangsawan. Okay, and that of course travelled as far as Indonesia as well as Brunei and so on and so forth. Now that is regarded as a national theatre in Malaysia now. Now what has happened there has been cleaned up. So originally it had Chinese stories, no more. They cut out everything. Indian stories are very limited now. They had all the Hamlet now, they do sometimes, they do Shakespeare once in a while. But now they call it Malay theatre. It's Malay National Theatre, and I keep seeing, I've written articles about this, and I say, no, the whole concept of that kind of a theatre is Indian. It came from the Renaissance, actually, the British brought it in, and then all the changes, and so on, and it became Indianized, because that's where you have 10 songs in every performance, you know, about 15, 20 dancers in every performance, just like the Malay movies. So this formula was actually from Bangsawan, became the Malay movie formula in Singapore, and movies started in Singapore, I think. So that's a formula and that's being used and so on. But now they're declaring that this is our national theatre and this is noble theatre and this is all that, you know, honourable theatre and uh, it belongs to the royalty and so on and so forth. This one is, is still getting some support from the uh, KL uh, City Council and the federal government. But, you know, they're not doing the right thing with it. What do you do with it? Because, you know, they don't, they're confused about how to modernise it. Either they throw away everything, all the backdrops and everything and make it really, you know, ultra-modern. You know, something, I mean, as well as an equivalent, similar kind of thing happening there. So, so that's changing a bit, and that is one which is still fairly active in the sense that there are only a couple of groups in KL which are sponsored by the Ministry of Culture. It doesn't exist in other provinces. This is national you know, adopted by the Ministry and so on. So, so, the, so these are the main uh, kinds of theatre forms, and I think I mentioned the main problems. I got signaled five minutes ago, about five minutes left. Mm -hmm. Now, so then given the fact, and this is a conclusion, given the fact that the, the Malay traditional art forms discussed in this paper developed as a result of participation in a shared heritage and much borrowing, it is evident that when it comes to regarding them as indigenous Malay, certain problems have arisen. Okay. When are they Malay, when are they not Malay? Right? So this is the issue. 
In the older forms such as the, the Malay Shadow Play and Mayo, both dramatic repertoire, content and spiritual colouring and all times uncomfortable have become problematic in the recent decades with the rising tide of the Malay nationalism and the strong influence of nascent Islam of a purist variety. Every day we hear stories of this. You know, on, online these last few weeks have been quite bad. So where, uh, where these very elements, nationalism in particular, and Islam or other Middle Eastern cultural features led to innovation and development in the less controversial Bangsawan, here too recent developments have not really succeeded. So that no real vibrancy is seen in the development of national Malay theatre as a whole. One is tempted in looking to, for causes or explanations to compare the situation in this situation with developments in neighbouring countries, particularly Indonesia. There are a lot of parallels, but Indonesia, of course, being a huge country and with all these you know, established traditions, the picture is different. But they do have some of these problems as well, some pockets here and there. But then that's, that's uh, the, the kind of comparison that we have to do. On the other hand, if one seeks comparison with Muslim majority countries other than Indonesia, Bangladesh would make an interesting choice. But Bangladesh is an Islamic country, very active in theatre, adopted you know, Hindu forms of theatre, you know, and, and make them localize, Islamicize them, and so on. They're going on they're very, very active still. That would be a country because it's vibrant uh, theatre forms there, uh, which may take into account consideration of uh, the presence of the presence of uh, Islam as well as keeping the traditions alive. So we have this conflict. There, of course, there are Hindu elements, but the problem is, I went to India about last year, I did a, I did a festival of Ramayana, and there was a whole group of Ramayana, a group that performing Ramayana. All were Hindus, I mean, all were Muslim, I'm sorry. You ask them why, they said, there's no, no problem. You transcend all these lower level, you know, things, and you go up into the higher symbolism, and then into mysticism, and Sufism, and all that. No problem. I was quite surprised to see a whole group of you know Rama. The guy bringing Rama must be about 30 now. He said he started about when he was 17 or 18. So that's about 13, 14 years he's playing Rama. Okay. And uh, you know, so that that's a different situation because in India, in Bangladesh, you know, uh, different, more tolerant and so on. Okay, so this is a rough picture then of uh, some of the problems and innovations and developments in theatre in Malaysia.